welcome him to come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Hussein, for coordinating this invitation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Morgan University and the International Affairs Office for this kind invitation. My name is Nur Bintud Khalil. I'm a linguist, scholar, and also I am the founder of the Nubian Land Society back in Sudan 2005. And today, uh, I would like to walk you through one of the dilemmas or maybe some of the images of our historical uh, Sudan or Nubia back in the days. Um, first of all, I should uh, say something that really I thank our elder Kanuta Moon, and he is our brother here, and he is one of our uh, big support when we came here. I came 2014, escaping persecution because of what we are doing in Sudan. He was like a big welcome and a big support, and then we were able to establish ourselves here back. And uh, we are now reaching out, not only to the Sudanese or the Nubian, but to, to all Africans. I have students uh, and, um, from different scholars, people who are interested in history. So it's also, uh, I'm, I, we are very open here for this invitation. I published a book for the first maybe book for teaching one of our Nubian languages, uh, uh, like a, a language acquisition project for the first time. So let's walk through. Our, our <coughs> presentation uh, named some images of multiculturalism in ancient Sudan. It's a paper that I published in 2015, it's already there, but today I'm gonna put more focus on some of the ideas uh, that have been uh, circulated here by you guys. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your discussions and I learned a lot today. And I hope I, this can support my claim. And uh, first of all, let's greet ourselves in our languages. <laughs> so we say in Nubi, Maska Jilo. And Maska Jilo. And this actually means uh, you keep the the spirit of goodness. So it's so linked to the Ka, which is, as you know, you are all Egyptologists, so yes. must, must means good, Ka means the spirit. spirit. So do you keep the good spirit? Maska Jilo. So welcome to Sudan, Nubia, uh, back in the days. So I'm gonna take you to a tour, actually, sort of this presentation. Uh, and I hope we will all enjoy uh, this tour. Uh, first of all, before I start, we're going back to the time before the colonization. Africa had been through like multiple layer of colonizations, not only the Arabs, not only the British in Sudan and Nigeria, not only Back in the days, many nations invaded us and controlled us and tried to reshape us and to redesign us, not mentally, socially, many things. So if we stop through the time and we like travel back and we'd like to think of one of the key pillars that we can say those are the main concepts that the African civilization stands on through history, I will think of these three things, which I always talk when I speak in the lectures. First concept is maternalism. And when I say maternalism here, because the term now is so wide academically and have been used with different disciplines, I simply refer to the state of motherhood and the state of motherhood in this culture, and particularly in the case of Nubia. And here I'm taking Nubia, please, as an example. But all what I'm going to say can be generalized and applied to the whole African nations, okay? So the state of motherhood. So this culture has appreciation for women, seeing women 
not as a feminine, again, it's masculine, not as a female object, but as a mother. And from there comes all the religions. Actually, even the language itself contains this uh, continuations of maternalistic views, and this applies to all over. That's why this can help us explain how the women has ascendancy. You mentioned Ashanti as a mother, as a as as, as a new Nubian descendant. They have uh, queen mothers. You see, one of the ancient time they have queen mothers. In Nubia, we have queen mothers. As we, as we will go, we'll go through this presentation. But the ascendancy of women was was because of this concept paved all the way for women to go and to gain this uh, this position and without any conflict. Because when we see in the Western model, we see women fighting until today to gain their rights and to women empowerment today and through generations. And But here, automatically the culture by default paved the way for the women because they think of the woman as, as a holy object because of this maternalistic view. So the second concept or the second pillar for the African civilization is the collective, the collectivism. And when I say collectivism, I refer here to the state of group practicing of life activities, socio-economical, could be culture, could be social, any type of practices is, is being practiced uh, in group. And then when you go to Africa, back in the days, and up, now it's changing because of some westernization, Arabization, you call it. I, I, the cover term for this is colonization, okay? But if you live in Africa, you can't just eat by yourself. You cannot just farm by yourself. You cannot do any practice by yourself. You have to be in a group. And this is how actually this, this uh, concept as we are going to the next one, this supports the next one because once you are sharing your life, so you have more openness to be acceptable to any, any ideas, any religion, any people, any race, and now the second part is multiculturalism, which I'm going to put more emphasis through this uh, presentation. Multiculturalism, I know the term is used now everywhere, but I refer specifically to this simple definition, the condition in which ethnic, relig religious, and cultural groups coexist together in one society. So the same society can adapt and host multi-culturalism means multi-race, multi-religions. That's why when you go to the museum, you see many gods, <laughs> many religions. You go, you see different languages, like country like Nigeria, how many, how many languages is within the same state? Like you see like multiple, and they all live together peacefully. Um, so, because of the time, I'm gonna go uh, fast on some of the ideas, because you guys, you all, you all scholar, you know this, I'm just giving some hints. So multiculturalism here. Um, I'm gonna actually stick to some ideas. Uh, first of all, multiculturalism as a concept, again, is monoculturalism. So the challenge here and thinking of how, in the case of Sudan. Sudan, since the time, because of those concepts being applied, there was, there was a civilization. There was Kerma, there was Merawi, Nabata, as we will go. After changing these pillars, or this, the, I think the, <coughs> the first destruction for any African culture when we start dismantling these pillars, when we start changing ourselves, then we go to this result. Instead of having multiculturalism, we have monoculturalism. 
because the other cultures thinking of the Latin North, so they have to have like one unique culture that dominates. So they have this, as our brother uh, explained, the hierarchy, like you have to have one on top and then you have the others comes until the bottom. But in the African idea, we have a circle shape of society instead of a hierarchy of a pyramid. We have a circle. Everybody is sharing because we are a collective society. Everybody is putting his culture and everybody is accepting the other. So you see, instead of having this pyramid of hierarchical cultures that we're gonna have like one on top dominates, we're gonna have like multicultural. And the same thing for ethnocentrism. Because when you have one dominant culture, automatically you have one dominant race that start looking down at the other race. As you see in the Western example, uh, one race dictates itself or name itself as a superior and then dictates its culture, its language, its everything. And it's naming as our brother was explaining, uh, very good. Everything comes from here, the ethnocentrism. So multiculturalism definitely was, when we have a multiculturalism, that means we are immune from these problems, cultural hegemony. Then the second thing, Multiculturalism leads to a culture egalitarian. People now are talking about egalitarianism. They are fighting through the democracy. But <laughs> after Obama, we got Trump. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a big retreat, right? It's a big loss. So all this you know, walk towards egalitarianism and, and towards like openness um, can be because we are not challenging the source of the problem. So the source of the problem is staying there. The culture itself is designed like this. So the impact of adopting ethnocentric values in multicultural society, look at the case of Sudan. Sudan, which I'm going to speak today about, back in the days was different, <laughs> way different, way peaceful. Now, war, as our brother said, victims of war, people being killed now, as I speak, as protesters in the streets, or maybe bombarded, receive uh, uh, attacks in their own village. So why? Because they want to impose a different system on people, and people start to resist so unless they yield and accept it as a fact, that becomes they lose land, they lose anything, or they just resist and then they fight. So, okay, let's walk through our history. So this is called karma. And karma was one of the ancient civilization in Nubia. And when I say Nubia, I refer to the whole land of Sudan and beyond, historically. And uh, I know some classes now with some Sudanese scholar when they come here in the West, they just want to emphasize that, hey, let's call it the Sudanese civilization. Let's call it uh, a Kushai civilization. But we back as uh, African scholar, we don't have distinction between Nubia or Kush or Tassiti, all those are the, the names of our people. But because of this mental gap between the Arabized scholars and the African scholars, they always have problems. So back in Kerma, it's actually, you see, very beautiful. You see how, and this is the, the city of uh, Dafufa. And this is a temple of Dukki Gale, and the word Dukki means temple, and Gale means red. 
So that was a, one of the ancient cities actually in, back in Africa. Um, so Karma was the current name for ancient Sudan. And I refer here, this is according to the, to the historical um, 2005 up to 116 BC. And this, they say roughly during the, mid, the middle kingdom of Egypt. So there was Karma. Karma was known to the world as the land of Kush. <coughs> so Karma located in Dukkigil, as I have just mentioned, and Dukkigil is not far from Dongola, where one of the big cities uh, in Sudan, just away from the capital Khartoum, you go here, this is the ancient Karma. So, so, in Karma, during that time, it was actually very open uh, culture, uh, very open society, very prosperous, very great. So where did this greatness come from? Thinking here of multiculturalism in Karma, according to some scholars, and I would like to refer here, some archaeologists, mentioned that the early Kushite or the early Karmites resemble the contemporary Northern Sudanese or Northern Nubians. And then in other excavation, we find also in some uh, burials, people referring to the people of uh, West Sudan. So through the excavation, generally, we find different group of people being buried together. And there is no doubt that was a multicultural society. Not only this, the temple itself showing that the signs that so multi-religious uh, faith or cults being practiced in Karma. Uh, the name itself, Kush, came as a dominant state later when one of those, uh, they call it chiefdoms. So the big chiefdoms was Kush. Uh, and then comes the name. So those chiefdoms were multicultural chiefdoms, like for different groups. They come together, and this is how the African civilization constituted. It's the union of people, not through force, not through war. It is just people share together what they have, and they start building uh, themselves up. And subsequently, what we have, we have during that time, the Dufufa was as a cosmopolitan city. All the trades come to Kerma, going back from, from there, from Africa to Kerma, and going to, to, the, to outside Africa. So it flourished as a center uh, in the south of Kemet. Uh, at that time. And the science of this is still, we can test it in the archaeology. Uh, based uh, on the archaeology also, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, diversity of people, diversity of religions, diversity of languages possibly, is expected <coughs> at that time. So, you see how naturally the multiculturalism was embedded in this civilization. Um, going back to going back again, but now we're coming to another stage of civilization in the land of Sudan or Kush or Nubia. And you see this. I think you are familiar with this. Uh, this is a. Amun from the temple of Verkal, and this is actually the pyramids in Sudan. Uh, near the Verkal, <coughs> we have two types of uh, pyramids, the ancient one that looks like the Egyptian, and then the new one, like the Merawite temple. So, and here, the land of Nubia, and in, in this era, it's called the Nabatan era. And this is where Nabata, and this is the Verkal, the mountain, 
the holy mountain. If the Jewish think uh, the Zion or the, the mountain of Zion, is, we think as African, this is the holy temple. And this is one of the famous uh, king, which I don't like to be called Pharaoh, Taharko, the historical uh, king. So in the Nabatan era, Nubia or Africa presented really one of the astonishing and, and, and amazing civilization to the world. Uh, you name it. Uh, it's, uh, this is just what we see in the, the museums. And you can see the style, you can see the, the some fabrication and how this sophisticated life they have. So we're not thinking of the archaeology here pieces, but thinking of multiculturalism. I'm tracing this multiculturalism in this era. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and I call it Kush II, A, the Nabata, was marked in the history as the most flourishing Sudanese of the people of Sudan. They're always very proud uh, about this time. And in that time, actually, which is around uh, 1800 BC, uh, the Nabata civilization was primarily centered in the holy mountain of Berko, which I refer back in the, uh, in the previous slide, uh, in the city of Nuri, during the Nabatan era. The famous king, uh, starting from King uh, Alara, the first king, going up to uh, King Bia, or the Egyptian they call Bayanchi, or Bayanchi, which was the founder of the 25th dynasty, uh, who ruled not only over Sudan, but also extended his rule to Egypt and beyond. And they have at least five kings after Bianchi before the kingdom shrink back again to Nubia. So Nabata was formed upon diversity. This is our discourse. Yes, we have seen many of uh, and I, uh, I refer here to many papers and many excavation uh, books that there is big sign for different cultures, different group of people, uh, different ethnicities, religions for sure, <clears throat> and also different languages. So the Nabatan were really open not only internally but also uh, externally. They are very open to diverse ideas, international cultures. This is one of the famous buildings you see in the, in the area of North Sudan. You see this is kind of more look like a, a different from the Nubian style. So they adopted different cultures and, and, and they went further uh, away from Egypt beyond to the land of Palestine and Israel. So we go into the Marawi time. This is Marawi, one of the shining times for the history of Africa, the pre-colonial Africa. So the time where the women ascendancy went to the to its uh, peak, the time of the Kandaka or the Kandasi. This all this are stolen now in museums by European. <laughs> and this is the Merawai uh, pyramid. It's a little bit different, became smaller, but very smart. I think you will see it in the dollar bill, right? And this is how Merawai as a complicated and sophisticated civilization presented the African uh, multiculturalism materialistic ideas to the world. And diversity in Meroe, no doubt. Meroe as a capital of kingdom, uh, after the, after the, the retreat, or say the defeat of this Nabatan kings, they started, the country started to uh, 
uh, decline and then we came to the time where they changed the city from Nori they went to further to the south they call it Meroe uh, by, the, by the city of Shendi today in Sudan in North Sudan and the royal city actually they have the burials and they also you will see the pyramids of Meroe exist many of them many and the flourishing time for Nubia for Africa was that time because <clears throat> the extract of iron, gold, uh, industry, the rise of the Kandakas, the Queen Mother as a powerful ruler. And not only that, as a linguist, I'm really interested in the other aspect of culture. We know yeah, or the Meroe era or the ancient Sudan or Kush presented to the world one uh, of the right ancient writing system. This was the geographic Egyptian. And then from that, they start changing from geographic to the Meroetic script. And, and this abject writing system known as the Meroetic script was prevalent actually, and was one of the reasons was prevalent in the ancient temples and the ancient practice. One of the reasons maybe uh, that we have writing very, in very ancient time. Um, okay, Meroe, and Nubia of today, they have connection through our languages, which is dying. The languages, what we are doing now, are preserving, are dying, but they keep linking us to our past. Not only for the Nubians, but all for all the Africans. If we lost the contemporary Nubian languages, not only one language, we have many Nubian languages, because as I've mentioned, we are multicultural, you can't see one form of thing. In Africa, you have to see different forms. So when you, when you see, think of Nubia, you think of multi-ethnical, multi-language. <coughs> they are similar, but this is the nature of our culture. So this language has connection with the Meroetic language. And this is not my, my claim. This one of the uh, European, uh, French, Claude really claim, and I'm just quoting his, his uh, from his book and his paper. And I took from other scholar uh, a list of words, and I just make a comparison between the Meroetic source and our tongue of today, the Nubi, which I and our brother speak, and we teach, and we see connection. We see good connection, not only in, uh, like I, I, I've took like in purpose, some different word from different do semantic domains, like uh, kinship terms, family words, uh, basic uh, verbs, and then also some uh, geometric ideas. So I found in different dom semantic domains, a good connection. And this could be a good introduction for, for us to start with, like digging. But the problem is, all of our uh, legacy, like I say, corpus legacy or old text, are not in Sudan, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Are still kept in, in universities in the West, with European specifically, scholars who are controlling this area of study. The Nubian, maybe I'm one of the fewest who were able to publish and to work by himself independently. And I receive a lot of war from other, this European, and a lot of attack. <laughs> and I start to refuse actually going now to these conferences because I feel like there is something going on. So those people not only colonizing us like in the past, they are also colonizing our academia of today, and they are controlling our platforms. So it's just uh, 
I have to create our own independent way of preaching our message to the young generation, to our brothers in Africa. So there is a big war here in academia, and we need your support uh, as scholars in this area. So just to extend my idea of multiculturalism, as a linguist, I want to give you like a good example. So the symmetry of Nubian languages. You see, those are languages in Sudan, in Nubia, spoken in North, Middle Sudan, West. They are geographically and politically isolated. And because of the situation, as our brother explained in Sudan, and since the situation does not even allow African to explicitly or like uh, in public practice this study or any do anything. But the phenomena that I found very interesting, all these languages, they, very, they hold a, a big symmetry uh, of relationships not only in the semantic domain, but also in the grammatical, in the syntax. So you look at this Nubian sentence, the structure is a subject, and then we have an object, and then the verb comes at the end. I just translate one sentence, I drank water, and I started from the old source, which was the source spoken during the Christian Nubia era, the old Nubia, and I moved. This is the West Sudan, far west, isolated group. They call themselves Tidnan, or the Middle. And I just found this symmetry, and I moved to, I took two source, two examples from Nuba, mountain in center, an area where there's war and isolated geographically. And I went to the north, to the Nile Nubians, and you see how the language look alike. Structurally, semantically, and I have never seen symmetrical like this. So, what I concluded and what I have learned from this lesson, that yet, any language has its own unique Better, but they all say and they all share something. And this is a good example for multiculturalism. And this can explain to us how the past was look like. So we have similar groups in culture, but they are unique also. And they are just live together and they 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 they, they, they appreciate this multicultural existence. And um the languages of today conveys our historical perception in the past, giving a real example from uh, our la one of the languages of today. And in this example, which is showing that this is a Nubian proverb, uh, it's, a, it's in the, this proverb reads. Let me read it in, no, in Nubian. Maybe our brother can help. <laughs> okay, again. <laughs> okay, Eget is the sheep. The sheep with the sheep gather. And the goat with the goat gather. So, is it a coincidence that Amun was depicted uh, in, uh, in the form of a sheep? And he was a symbol of goodness because what we understand from our culture, this proverb that the sheep is a symbol of goodness, the good with the good gatherer, and the bad, and the devil always depicted, even in now, they depicted as, as the goat. So, all this idea, as this is a real, like a real example for your claim of all this idea of religion, you call you name it, just taken from your culture. And now there is one missing part of this. Your languages is actually a bridge for you that you can claim back those ideas. 
because this is a good bridge for you guys uh, towards coming back and I'm sure this one example from one source let's as an African using our African mind sit together and study those sources in the in the north of Africa in the west in the south wherever and I'm sure we're gonna come back with a big result that will astonish the world and revolutionize revolutionize, revolutionize uh, a big so here this methodological representation of a sheep have been adopted by Christianity by Islam by all the biblical uh, ideas so okay good so Christianity came to Nubia Christianity came to Nubia Nubia being Christianized that's why you see this now I'm using some Greek alphabet and this is a part of uh, the historical influence but the Christianization, the Christianization of Kush or Nubia occurred but it didn't change this is one of the things because when we study actually this era yes the Nubian yes they accepted Christianity but they accepted with their own philosophy it didn't make this deep damage <clears throat> on the pillars that I introduced in the beginning so you see here in this picture maternalism so the queen mother was the, you see that this is the queen they accepted mary as a queen source of holiness blessing the queen mother and then the queen mother bless the nation this is how they understand the christianity and it was very unique um not in the case of uh, uh by the way, I appreciate Islam, very good. But I'm talking about the culture of Islam being introduced to Sudan, not the religion, not the faith, not the spirituality. So here, I, I the, the Christian kingdoms are all in, uh, they have three different Christian. And this is also another dialima in the history. We have three different Christian kingdoms. They all have different diverse people at least thinking of one source of language one source of people one source of culture they live peacefully for 1200 years without war without any problem is that is that something very interesting right without even thinking one of this kingdom that will come and take over the other uh, this is not the, the same thing happening in any other areas. Like think of uh, the West uh, and Europe. Think of always they're gonna have a fight. <clears throat> but we never we never recorded any battle between these three kingdoms, which is very interesting. Um, this is the old Bumian script. Uh, they use the Greek, and then uh, our old Bumian language is what we base our our study of today because it's contain a lot of link to the Meroetic and link to the contemporary so it's like a bridge between us and the past it's a very important source one of the one of the people who worked is actually an american scholar called brown gerald brown uh, he passed 2004 i wasn't he was my friend by like by correspondence, we just exchange email, and I, I was young at that time, and he just passed. I think he was he did good in this language. Um, this is one of the crises, the exodus of the Nubian uh, in Sudan, particularly here, because I'm from Sudan. Same thing happened, and that, and then the loss and the damage and the destruction of uh, the Nubian culture, and it's still going on. Uh, and, different part of Sudan so who are we we are the Nubian language society an independent body who are working to uh, relink ourselves first uh, to Africa and we are an organization now in US in DC we teach the language of Nubia, the languages of Nubia, 
and we are very involved in the documentation, the promotion of Nubian language and culture. Uh, we are in partnership with Molefe Kate Asante, and, and we are welcome uh, any participation. We have a website, please, you can go and visit. We have a lot of projects going on for the uh, revitalization, and, and we welcome uh, different scholars. We, our platform is open for all the African scholars and linguists to come, and we have a lot of work, actually. And actually, this year, we are intended to extend some, some of our work. We're going to publish some dictionaries. We are open to publish some translated work. So if you feel you have uh, support, or if you are interested in this is your area, if you, even university, want to adapt of some of our work, you are welcome. And we are really appreciate that. And thank you for this invitation. And I just have to say it in our language. I welcome Skew Lijer. I thank you all uh, and thank you very much for this presentation and for this kind of invitation.